That was a long answer. I kind of went here and then went there. And it it was, but also Jason opened the door and popped an envelope in. And both of us, <laughs> at the very end, both of us were trying to read what was on the envelope, and I didn't catch what it was. Did you catch what it was? Something about Argo, but I – maybe Jason oh, will come I back. Oh, I want to mention that. Yeah. Oh, please, yeah. <laughs> I, know, I know what it is now, now that you said Argo. Yeah. Go, go yeah. ahead. <laughs> Welcome to Trucking Forward, where two former, oh, one former engineer and one current engineer uh, sit around in a very small, uh, awkward space and talk everything autonomy and trucking uh, and startup culture and a whole bunch of other things, and I could probably ramble on forever. Uh, my name's Tim. My name's Adam. And uh, Adam, since I said we just talked about a bunch of things, what are we talking about today? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, so today we're talking to Richard Bishop, oh. who brings, well, before I butcher it, Richard, can you tell us about yourself? Oh, yeah, sure. I haven't done any real engineering since about 1991. Um, started out in the government and initially DOD, where I did real stuff, and then into DOT, where I became a program manager for vehicle highway automation um, in, in, in the research side, which was a a very cool run. There's a lot to be said there, but I don't want to get into it. Um, and once uh, we'd done some pretty amazing things, I decided I was tired of my commute and all that. I wanted to try working on my own, and it, it actually worked. I didn't. <laughs> I'm very, very <laughs> fortunate about that. So ever since then, I've been a big picture guy, trying to put my arms around everything that's happening in the autonomy space. Um, I was involved in the uh, the DARPA Urban Challenge, and you know that was a turning point because it brought Google in, and then suddenly other startups showed up who actually weren't scared by hardware. You know, before that, startups meant software. Yeah. And so I've been surfing the wave ever since. Um, I'm working at, as a strategy advisor for several of the truck AV developers and supporting passenger car OEMs, uh, writing for Forbes.com. So um, I, I aim to kind of know what's going on everywhere and uh, try to, you know, sort through it and figure out what's significant and what's fluff. So, Richard, you it sounds like you feel like you made a really good choice in kind of that transition to establishing your own consulting firm. What spurred you to do that? Ah, um, it, the commute was a big part, but I think I've been working for 20 years uh, professionally and. I was tired of all the bosses above me and that kind of thing. I was, you know, I think I was just ready for a change. I'm ne and I've never liked office culture. <laughs> <laughs> okay, when I'm, I, I'm around the, the, I'm working from the house all the time. I'm usually sitting in a wicker chair in the backyard. Uh, you know, I got my internet going and all's good. So that's like all office culture. It's not just like a particular office culture, just right. all of it. Oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> I, I go back and forth. I actually had the comment today, like, yeah, you know, some days it'd be really nice to be working from home. <laughs> well, back then, work from home was a radical idea. So these these days, you, you guys and everybody else have it a lot. I was going to say, there's a lot of people that can now work from a wicker chair in their backyard. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and do. Thank, thank goodness. <laughs> a little more sanities out there. So, Richard, I was... Um, I was digging through some of the content that I saw that you had written and things like that, and you're actually kind of your byline really stuck out to me. Jumped in uh, first automated vehicle in 91 and haven't looked back. And so I'm really curious, like, can you tell us just a little bit about what you've seen in that time? Like, um, what's changed and what's the same and just your perspective on it? Yeah, yeah. That first automated vehicle was um, at, at the grounds of NIST, National Institute of Standards and Technology, and they had a very active program in uh, robotics for DOD, including the idea of scout vehicles, unmanned scout vehicles who could go see what the enemy's doing and, and not risk soldiers. And that military side was a, a big push, even from the 80s forward. And people like Chris Thurmson uh, benefited from that, uh, as well as my program, which also involved Carnegie Mellon. Uh, and as it came into the 
the civilian side with with my program at USDOT, it was about traffic uh, improvement. So we were mm -hmm. doing tuning of cars, close headway platooning, specifically so that traffic could flow better. Uh, it sounds weird to talk about now. Nobody's talking about that anymore. Um, and so, the, but the real key is that that work, there was similar European work, there was similar Japanese work. Everything that was happening was happening because of public money, one way or the other. Uh, and it's going back to Google and the urban challenge. That's when things shifted to private money, real deal, private money at a meaningful level, actually developing systems for the market. The, uh, the car OEMs and, and truck OEMs, not to criticize them, but they might have gotten there eventually, but they had no forcing function. Yeah. Uh, you know, they they're fine as, as long as they're selling cars and trucks, they're fine. They just have to keep up with their competitors, particularly in passenger cars. That's that's how advancement happens is competitiveness. So I saw all this going on um, and it it moved slowly at first. Uh, the world was a little bit distracted by the V to X thing for a while. Uh, it has its place, but I think automation came through a different portal, basically, the DARPA challenge, et cetera. Um, and Google gave it acceleration, clearly, and that was a car-oriented activity. The, um, then things started to percolate around trucks, uh, Peloton technology, uh, mm -hmm. put together the idea of uh, truck platooning specifically for fuel economy due to drafting. And uh, all the engineers said, yeah, you know, that'll work. Uh, the challenge is to make it into a product. And uh, platooning was hot for a while. But meanwhile, the, uh, the what I call the solo driverless truck guys started popping up. Um, it was uh, Too Simple and um, Aurora and this and that. And, and that ended up overshadowing platooning um mm -hmm. and the um you know the energy amongst the trucking industry was um was skeptical at first they were skeptical of platooning that's kind of their what they should be doing and and yet you know so i spent a lot of time trying to bring coherence to all of that and there was a lot of noise out there uh depending on the company and I'm, I'm glad a couple of the companies are sort of out of the picture, actually. And yet it's it continued to, you know, solid technical gains were being made. And um, we've seen it become legit on the truck side and amazing what we're seeing in robo taxi now, e even though there's a, a lot of chatter coming out of San Francisco about depending on who's talking, how horrible it is. It's really not horrible. It is. These are very effective systems. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, especially the cruise vehicle, they, they do dumb stuff, but the media misses the fact that these were dumb operational things. They weren't dumb safety things. All that kind of noise is out there in robotaxi. Uh, truckings, in that sense, had a little easier now. So I was reading one of your um, articles in Forbes where you were specifically talking about the San Francisco safety fog um, uh, there. And you did in that article just as you did right now make a differentiation between um operational downtime and safety downtime can you go into a little more detail of kind of what you see as the dividing line there and in, in the the explicit difference that you're you're calling out yeah the um this the safety case which you guys know and everybody developing automated trucks know that you you have to fulfill your safety case purely with equipment on your truck or your own data feeds or whatever mm -hmm. um and that safety case uh, fundamentally is about not harming any other traffic participant so a simple way to say it there's more to it than that um that's you know and if that is a if that fails then you've you've harmed somebody mm -hmm. in a in a physical way you know possibly a life-threatening way You've uh, on the other side, an operational situation, you've you've irritated somebody or you've uh, caused a, a inefficiency in the overall traffic flow. That's just a different animal. It, it shouldn't be tolerated, uh, but it's a, a very different animal. OK, so you're I think one of the things you mentioned in that article was um, crews operationally had to shut down 
um, some of their vehicles uh, due to a cellular cellular outage um, where they weren't able to maintain communication with the vehicles, but that nothing safety related had occurred to the vehicles. The vehicles came to a stop appropriately. They didn't um, harm anything in the environment or anybody in the environment um, and kind of differentiating out um, there. I'm curious if you take that same kind of safety and operational split to the trucking side, what do you see as differences there? What do you see as like operational stand downs from a trucking standpoint and, and how those will be affected? Oh yeah. Good question. Um, I guess it's fair to say the, the safety side of that is essentially the same. Um, no mm-hmm. harm to other traffic participants and you know, no harm to the vehicle itself. You don't want to run into a tree either. Yeah. Um, the operational side, we, we get into, um, the the aspect of how much remote support do you need how much on-site support do you need um in terms of truck for whatever reason for a safety reason pulls over and notifies uh torque or whoever that it it cannot recover from this on its own there's a um there you have irritated customers whoever owns that freight uh that's not the end of the world uh, but you also have a cost component. So it's mainly a cost component there. Uh, mm-hmm. Aurora, in one of my recent articles, Aurora was talking about their some metrics they have specifically about um, roadside assistance, remote assistance. And it, it looked pretty good, but nevertheless, uh, those numbers have to be tracked really closely if you're actually going to start making meaningful revenue. You don't want to erode your revenue with that. Um, and, and so really we, we want to avoid any on-site assistance and the, um, remote, um, supervisor, there's different terms for it. I think everybody's doing that. It, it makes sense. There's ways to, to make that more and more efficient, which will also be a competitive discriminator just in terms of the, the cost burden of running the overall operation. Yeah, I was going to say one of our one of our previous guests, Walter, would uh, would have jumped in here and said that, you know, trucking runs on razor thin margins. Um, So any competitive any the savings of pennies actually equates to competitiveness. um, Yeah. In the trucking industry. It's quite amazing. So I guess one of the things I was interested in just kind of reading through some of your background, it seemed like you had a particular interest in trucking. I'm curious, just from your perspective, what drives that interest versus maybe even some of the robotaxi space? Where do you see as kind of the differentiators, et cetera? It, it happened organically, that that energy. I, I knew the guys uh, early on in, in platooning, and that pulled me in. And I, I can just see a more coherent world to operate in with trucking. It's, it's B2B and issues that researchers like to uh, you know, worry about and talk about that it makes for good research, but, uh, that's when you're doing, a, a, a an AV working with society somehow working with consumers, uh, trucking is much more straightforward. Uh, it's <laughs> a lot of people would say, are you kidding? It's not straightforward, but compared to a, a robo taxi operation, it, it sort of is. And if, if you're, if you're a truck fleet needs to move freight and you don't like what you're seeing, you just walk away because you have an, you already have an, an operation. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it nevertheless, the, um, the attraction part of truck truck automation is mind blowing, right? Mainly because you don't have the driver hours of service issues and operationally uh, supply chain, you can do so many more things you couldn't do before. You can sit down a thunderstorm because time is not so precious. You can drive mostly overnight because potentially the, the roadway is less risky um, and get loads, uh, you know, from uh, California to uh, Atlanta in about two days if, if you'd feel the need to do that. So this is going to start intersecting. I mean, it, it'll mainly be dealing with current road freight, but it'll intersect with uh, the rail as an alternative. The trucks may look a lot better for rail, and, and so we'll pull freight off a of rail, and even air freight because there's some air freight that really has to get there in a matter of hours. But oftentimes there's air freight that could take two days, but they know a truck won't get it there that soon, and there, a train won't get it there that soon. So it still goes on an airplane. 
So there's at the supply chain level, which is not my expertise, uh, I'm, I'm really watching and trying to learn how this is percolating in, in that sense. So just um, just for clarifying for the audience and, and also arguably for me, when you say B2B, what do you mean when you say that? Um, business to business, of course, and, okay. but, uh, you know, versus business to consumer, which um, Got it. that's okay. important for the uh, – the the in the freight world for the folks who want to deliver potentially to homes which can be done it's just challenging and then probably just another follow-up question just thinking about kind of the audience information when you talk about platooning even even prior to i think the daimler acquisition of torque that was a popular idea within daimler what are your thoughts on why platooning kind of fell off um <clears throat> from what i can pick up um, there are some process things and some, some outcome things. Uh, Daimler was active in platooning and eventually they decided that it just wasn't compelling enough. They're, they said words to that effect mm -hmm. in terms of the, um, the, the fuel economy benefit, which was the main benefit for the level one platooning where both drivers are engaged um, versus the um, also some operational challenges of bringing two trucks together from the same fleet. It depends on how your freight's running, but the companies that were really into it, like Peloton, they were seeing significant, a significant enough share of players who, who wanted it, wanted to move forward with that. Um, UPS was, was quite interested. Uh, we had locomation involved up, um, up until recently. The it you know it it seemed to become a thing of yeah the the benefit is there but the 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 slice of the industry was sort of getting narrower mm -hmm. and the uh, it seems to me my own speculation the mine the mind share of trucking executives at UPS and anywhere else that you can only go so far and they are already most of their brain is on electrification and when it came to automation here's this sort of monster benefit possibility that's not here and now, but they're not in a huge rush, which is solo driverless platooning, uh, <laughs> solo driverless trucks and uh, platooning kind of faded, faded away. There were also some uh, issues uh, in terms of the funding environment, the uh, economy, economic environment around COVID and some testing and trials couldn't happen, which if they had, I think, uh, at least one company would have been shipping product and we would we would have a, an active platooning provider. So when we when we started the discussion, you had you mentioned that basically you got kind of your first inoculation into this industry in, in 91. So you've been in this for a long time and I'm curious, um, over, I guess, what would that be? 30, 30 plus years. Um, what are some of the things that have really stood out? Like what are the <clears throat> marker points for you, um, as this industry has matured? Ah, right. Certainly the DARPA urban challenge. Um, mm -hmm. where I think most people would, <laughs> Yeah, agree yeah, with you there. That included both cars and trucks, uh, so I'm I'm very pleased about that and to have been a part of it. What are the other markers? Um, you know, most people would say it's the marker of of you know, company shows up, another company, you get this population of companies, and this company falls off, and the other falls off, and that seems to be how everybody marks the milestones in the space, which is not a bad way to do it. I think um, what what gets missed is there are even as some folks fall fall away, there are pockets of strength. Um, and I I will say you know I'll say to some listener these these few companies are pretty strong, but I I can't prove it because I don't mm -hmm. have inside knowledge, and inside knowledge shouldn't shouldn't be shared. So folks pay a lot more attention to um, the failures and the strengths. But, but mm -hmm. to get back to your question, um, another milestone occurred when um, the, the federal government put out a, what they called AV guidance. Um, 
and it the first couple of versions of this were only about the car side and then the i think the yeah third version was about trucks and buses and for the first time they said that the current regulations on the books which are silent about automation because nobody thought about that back when those regs were passed um the the federal government says that if uh, a, a, a computer is driving the vehicle, then any regulations that are written about human drivers do not apply. And it was sort of a soft endorsement that this is OK. Um, let me springboard from there to say that uh, you know, the federal regulations are sometimes talked about as this big, hairy set of things that have to be dealt with before uh, Torque and Aurora and Plus can actually get out there with the product, but that's mainly not the case. The current regulations and that guidance, even though it's a little clunky because it leaves things to the states, it, it works for commercial deployment. Um, and there's really only one thing that's kind of a hang up, which is this uh, ar archaic rule about if, uh, if the truck does pull over to the side of the road, uh, a warning triangle, ha triangle, reflective warning triangle has to be put mm -hmm. some distance behind the truck by the driver, of course. Um, <clears throat> and it's hard to do that if you've got a driverless robot truck. Uh, and so there's active, um, an active uh, process. Uh, the industry, the Automated Vehicles Industry Association has requested an, ex an exemption from that that would simply offer a... Uh, bright, uh, prominent light on the truck cab roof that also can signal to people in cars that something's on the shoulder. Um, mm -hmm. And this doesn't have to pass, but it will, will be messy if, if, if they don't um, for guys like Torque. And I, I think something will be worked out in that sense. And, and the cool thing is it would be for uh, regular truckers, not just AV trucks. And there's a lot of drivers, I can bet, they don't want to walk out on that shoulder when they've got a pro problem. So the, the regs are important, uh, but not as, as, as challenging as the media sometimes makes it out to be. And then Congress is in the act. So you hear you see a lot of headlines about hot Congress and this and that. Um, that really doesn't matter that much for the AV trucking world. It, it matters for those who are developing vehicles, custom vehicles with no driver controls. And then you need exemptions from NISA, and I won't go into all of that. But if you're working with a vehicle that meets all the uh, regulations now, which anything that rolls off the assembly line from Daimler and the others, that would be the case, uh, that's not a big deal. So we've, we've got a pretty good landscape looking forward, uh, one thing to deal with, and we're, we're good for deployment. That was a long answer. I kind of went here and then went there. And it it was, but also Jason opened the door and popped an envelope in. And both of us, <laughs> at the very end, both of us were trying to read what was on the envelope, and I didn't catch what it was. Did you catch what it was? Something about Argo, but I – maybe Jason oh, will come I back. Oh, I want to mention that. Yeah. Oh, please, yeah. <laughs> I, know, I know what it is now, now that you said Argo. Yeah. Go, go yeah. ahead. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll tell it the way I've been telling other folks. When uh, – you know, Argo got dissolved by their owners, Ford and Volkswagen, and Argo was working on robo taxis. Brian Selesky was is, was the uh, CEO, and um, when and of course the media went nuts with that about doom and gloom and everything is falling apart, mm -hmm. and that's usually what prompts me to write an article. I'm like, come on, people, chill out. There's more to it than that. Um, I was uh, wondering. I, there was some pr very cryptic press about. Brian Selesky was going to start a new um, AV company. He retained something like 40 engineers, and but that's about all that was said. And then there was a little tidbit that he's probably going to check work on the truck side. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I, I work a lot with with Gaddick, which which runs on on city streets, uh, short haul B two B, and I've been amazed that they don't have a competitor yet because it's a very solid use case, but they don't. I think. Waymo would have gone there if they hadn't pulled back from trucking for a while. So I just figured that's what Brian was going to do because he has robo taxi experience, streets, no problem. Um, 
So today we heard that he's the new player in long haul trucking, class eight tractor tra trailers. The company is called Brand, right? I thought I it was right uh, Stack AV. Oh, Stack. Yeah. There you go. Um, Stack AV. And good on them. They're, you know, starting in a new space. To, depends on who they actually have on staff. But I, I think it's good. I can imagine plenty of pundits saying, um, hey, it's too late, you know, way too late to the game. But this is a very big industry and it's, it's no problem for a, a qualified company to come in at this stage and be behind others. But so what? There's going to be plenty of customers out there. Yeah, I think we've we've always taken the position that if, so there will always be more than one supplier in this market there will yeah, always be oh, more yeah. than one name my instinct is is that's actually good news like yeah. not necessarily <laughs> looking at it competitively but just enrichment of the industry overall experience how it drives forward i think that's fantastic so, yeah and the yeah. fact that there's funding out there from softbank uh you know big vote of confidence for the industry overall the yeah. the other piece i wanted to mention in terms of strength um and it so happens that you guys are in a good spot is um uh, there are the various companies with OEM uh, partnerships, uh, Aurora with, with Volvo, for instance, uh, you guys with Daimler. And there, as, as commercial uh, introduction of level four AVs happens, they're going to need the level four ready trucks from the factory. Um, and that, that's looking pretty good for the initial tranche of, of trucks because of these partnerships. But to really scale up, to get the revenues you, meet, you need to start to move towards profitability, you're going to be kind of uh, at the mercy of the truck OEMs. Uh, any company uh, is going to be at the mercy of the truck OEMs because they have many players to sell trucks to. And now um, Stack is out there and uh, all of that. So that'll be a very challenging thing in terms of scaling up for the various truck AV guys. It works in a great place. You're 51% owned by Daimler, and uh, you, you've got a, a very sweet situation in that sense. Um, you might be constrained too, but that could be, you know, due to just normal truck manufacturing issues. Yeah, I think, fair. So. I yeah. think we would we would <laughs> we would say that uh, I think our partnership with Daimler Trucks is very beneficial for us. Yeah, hundred um, percent. And so, like, yeah. Um, <laughs> And definitely gives us um, gives us a distinct advantage uh, in the industry. And and you know what's uh, the, one of the big question marks out there is um, Trayton, uh, owner mm -hmm. of Navistar here in the U.S. Yep. They had a the the first partnership with an ADS developer uh, with Too Simple, and Too Simple went through its machinations, and that partnership dissolved. So it's still a question mark. Who are they going to partner with? I'm virtually certain that they plan to be a very significant player in this space, but not a peep from from that quarter. So I'm I'm watching and waiting. I think us too. Yeah, I'm yeah. curious, uh, Richard. You you obviously work with a lot of companies um, in this space, and and you have an experience with a lot of companies in this space. What do you kind of, how do you go about choosing who you're going to work with and, and the areas that you want to support? Um, that's a great question. I, um, sometimes it's a conflict of interest, you know, and, and occasionally um, client one will have a sort of a narrow um, focus like yard tractors, which is a, a great space out of itself. And then client two has a very broad interest. And then they show up one day and say, we're going to do yard tractors now. And I have to make a choice. Yeah. That, that kind of things go on. But it's, it's also, you know, I'm useful to companies. The, the earlier there they are in their process because they don't know what they don't know. Um, and, you know, to those kinds of guys, I'm a trucking expert, man. When I get around <laughs> truckers, I don't know anything. So, yeah. I, I used to think I knew trucks and then you start talking to some of the people, you start that really, talking do, to people yeah. really know trucks and you're like, Oh, I don't know anything. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm looking for, um, um, a variety of use cases. That's why it's cool that I work with, with Gaddick, which is in a, 
completely different use case from plus who I work with is doing uh, long haul level four. Um, and it's, and it's fun that way. Yeah. I like, I, I, I imagine it's fun. I, one of the things that I'm passionate about in robotics is the, the way that robotics can be applied to so many different fields and, and robotics kind of shows up everywhere. And it also kind of pulls together all the different disciplines of engineering um, to be, to build a good robot, you have to be a really good, uh, you have to have really good mechanical engineering. You have to have really good controls engineering, you have thermal design kind of just across the board. You have to pull it, you have to pull it all together. And so it sounds to me like kind of from your consulting side, you're, you're kind of looking at like, what, what are all the different ways that autonomy can be applied? And do I, am I working with a company that is uh, applying it in each of those unique ways, um, which sounds yeah. awesome. Yeah, and I'm always I'm I'm focused on generation after next. You know, here here's a whole crop of folks that are doing what they're doing. That's great. As the more mature they get, the less I'm needed, which mm -hmm. is fine. I'm saying, okay, what's what's on the horizon? So, a question I would have: um, clearly, a pile of experience, obviously very informed in the space. Um, looking at kind of your advice to the audience, like where are you getting that information? Like, what's your must-read list? What are the things to stay tapped into? Like, what's your advice there? Hmm. Uh, read my articles, of course. <laughs> uh, you I guys think, should, read, uh, should read his articles. They're pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it was, you know, it, the Forbes.com thing just came, came out of nowhere. They're, they're, they've got like a couple of thousand contributors across any number of uh, uh, mm -hmm. topics. But that's, that's been really sweet because I've always enjoyed writing, actually. What are my sources? Um, it's, um, you know, Freight Waves is great. The information is, is good. Um, auto news, transport topics. Um, and sometimes it's, it's a, it's a two way street. Sometimes I'll, I'll be punching them about some piece of information or they're reaching out to me. Um, but I think, you know, Freight Waves um, re really stands out because it's so truck specific. And they're and transport topics. They're they're very savvy about. They follow the AV truck side for quite some time. Same people, so they mm -hmm. they've got that internal sense for things. Awesome. So then I, I guess to I'm, uh, sorry. Go ahead. What what I'm skeptical of is, you know, the the core journal. Well, I guess one form of being a journalist is to the the bigger the crisis, the better. I'll get more attention from people, and that's just the nature of news and uh, the, the companies that want to operate that way. I, I don't think it's helpful and I'm usually pushing back against them, but it is fine to ask hard questions. And I think some of these journalist out, output um, um, uh, sources I just mentioned, they're, they're pretty good at that without sort of flying off the handle. So how about you guys? What do you, where do you get your information? Oh, that's a good question. Um, internal. <laughs> I think that the best part <laughs> yeah. about working with a group of so many people um, that are uh, so passionate about the space is all of our internal channels are basically live and up to date with whatever's coming out that seems relevant and or questions or cutting edge, especially kind of being more on the technology side. I um, feel like I'm getting some sort of news article probably every other day of look at this cool new thing in the industry or look at how this is moving and that's been one of the fascinating things also just about, I think, the podcast, but also um, engaging with other parts of the organization, et cetera. Yeah. We've just expanded, at least for me personally, I've expanded that network of <laughs> now I'm getting like, hey, look at this cool cutting edge business case or whatever else or how the people are thinking about how to market the problem or whatever else. So Yeah, that's, that's what I would say. So a lot of the, a lot of the same sources you just uh, listed I think are really good um, sources like freight waves and um, transport. And we kind of get those kind of internally where we'll have like a, a news channel and somebody say, Hey, you know, five minutes after an article has been posted, have you read this yet? And you can start to see those articles from a bunch of different sources. And then, um, we obviously have a fantastic, um, communications team and they're constantly looking for, you know, what's going on in the industry. And then can be trying to communicate that to us so that we have that information, we know what's going on and, um, um, we can, um, act on that um, as much as possible. Mm -hmm. And then as Adam said, part of doing 
uh, meeting so many people through this podcast and through other events. We have established networks and now you kind of, as you, as you alluded to earlier, you start getting information through those networks and sharing information through those networks where you're communicating and yeah. saying, you, yeah. have you heard about this going on? What do you think about that? What do you think the impacts on the industry are going to be, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Hey, I've got a, a quick little question. One more question for you guys. Uh, in the sensor world, perception world, but the hardware side, uh, do you see any real innovations happening there? Of course, there's press releases that'll say a, amazing in, innovation, or is it kind of mature and, and incremental sort of progress? That's an interesting question. I think. So, I, from my perspective, I would say it's a little bit of both. Yeah. I'm. Um, we are looking at kind of some of your traditional technologies, um, LiDAR, camera, radar, you know, the, kind of the big three that you hear about, a lot of incremental progress. And I, I would say even looking at what it means to make incremental progress is also, I would say, a little bit in the weeds for kind of your average listener. There's obviously ranges and data densities and all these things that are, I would say, really obvious of what that incremental progress looks like. But then you start looking at... Um, what does it mean to harden it and get it into production yeah. and make sure it's meeting all those vibration characteristics and producible yeah. and doesn't burn out after, you know, 3000 hours of operation. And that's where I would say there are probably from my perspective of being kind of the consumer, they're incremental, but I imagine there's also, they're fundamentally changing what's under the hood too. Right. And so I see leaps and bounds. I, with, I think you see that too, with like the, the tech, not just the, you were very right about kind of as your product trying to, productionize something, it goes from being a prototype to actually being something that you can count on for safety um, is, is a huge engineering challenge. But even the technologies under the hood, if you talk about like LiDAR, for example, there are... FMCW. Yeah, that's the you, one that's standing out to me. Yeah, Exactly. So oh, like yeah. there's some LiDAR yeah. makers and even um, Aurora in their internal um, yeah. product are moving to a different way of measuring, for lack of a, a better description here... Um, of measuring the LiDAR return um, from what was done traditionally. But on the surface, it's still just a LiDAR. It's still a laser that's shooting out and getting a return. But you get different information in, um, in measured in a different way, which adds new opportunities and, and the ability to, to yeah. use new and different algorithms. I think right. the same can be said in um, all three of the main sensing modalities, kind of as that you do get those on the surface, iterative improvements, but they can be fundamental shifts um, underneath. Mm. Very interesting. Thanks for that. So I turn, I'd say, interestingly hard questions back. You said something earlier about uh, some of the media outlets asking hard questions, and it really got me thinking, what are your hard questions? Like, what are the things you're looking for? What are those, I'd say, in the weeds things that really draw your attention? Oh, yeah. I, I want to see... just ask a journalist to hit you with hard questions? I didn't say I was going to answer them. It's like... Yeah, this is really. I, I can't. But how can you turn away from that? It's so appetizing. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm I'm looking for proof points. Uh, you know, ADS guys who say, uh, ADS truck guys who say, in you know, a couple of years we're going to have you know hundreds of trucks working with company X. That doesn't cut it anymore. You know, and it may be that's your plan, and you don't have a proof point. It doesn't mean you just have no basis, but that that's where your aspiration is. But, you know, another example is I, I love what Aurora is doing in particular because they, they, as I think I mentioned before, they're slicing it up and saying, here's our latest progress in this quarter. Being a public company, you have to, you're more uh, obligated to do that. Um, but I think it's, you know, it could still be BS. It could be, but I, I you know, they've kind of earned trust in, in lots of ways over the years. Um, so it's, it's it's mainly mainly proof points and then it's about customers uh that's what's cool about gaddick because they their customer list is crazy impressive and you and then okay great you got a customer now do you have that customer speaking directly to the media and really waving the flag you know a walmart or whoever this this is not a big deal to the entire company are their pr guys going to get into that but if if that happens that says a lot about the value of the offering um and then the other would be the the revenue approach how do you how do you actually write a contract for uh, your new customer is it 
okay, I'm going to move your freight. And uh, I don't know exactly what the per mile rate will be or, or is that defined um, clearly with showing that or proving whatever that premise of autonomy that it's going to be significantly cheaper. Um, and yet the autonomy player still is going to make a profit. That, you know, that's a big premise. <laughs> it seems to be moving. Yeah, the development of the company seem to be moving de definitely in that direction. But that's that's a huge premise. So I guess with those proof points that you were just listing there, what do you see as the next five years in the space or the next 10 years in the space? It, it'll be about scaling up. Um, uh, Torque uh, and Daimler said 2027, I believe it is. Uh, that's um, that's significant. That's classic for an OEM. OEMs, you know, don't need to speak to the earliest possible date. Uh, some people would have reacted to that of, oh, my God, that's forever from now. No, that's just how OEMs operate. Um, so next five years, I, I'm fairly convinced. Uh, unless there's some kind of economic shock, we'll see at least Aurora and uh, torque uh, trucks in significant quantities, probably uh, several other companies. Um, we'll see all the major truck OEMs matching them with the level four ready trucks with all the redundancy. Um, and that combination is pretty much makes, makes things go in terms of, the the freight world changing just like the proliferation of robo taxis uh you know right now unless you live where robo taxis operating it doesn't affect you but um once it's in your city it can change your lifestyle and with um with trucks you know every consumer in the u.s is going to be a beneficiary of, of automated trucks and they're going to be on the on the road next to an automated truck all that stuff's going to be going on so the way people in San Francisco are so used to seeing uh, Cruz and Waymo, just imagine five years from now or whatever, maybe a little more, the average person when they get on an interstate highway, oh, yeah, there's an automated truck going down the road. I see those all the time. Well, Richard, um, as we mentioned earlier, uh, you, you can be found on Forbes. You've got some fantastic articles out on Forbes. but. If people want to know more and, and hear more from you, where else can they find you? I've got a website. It's www.richardbishopconsulting.com. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for sitting down with us and um, yeah. talking over your history in the space and kind of where you think the space is going. Um, I really enjoyed this conversation. Yeah, likewise, Richard. It's been a real pleasure. Good. Thanks, Tim and Adam. I've enjoyed it too. And I hope we can uh, meet up face to face at a conference or something sometime. I look forward to it. Sounds fantastic. Yeah. Enjoyed awesome. it. Cool. Now we cut and we relax. <laughs> <laughs>